Hello amateurs, welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and I've got another amazing guest for you today. And actually, uh, myself and this guy, we've got a few things in common. We both played for Charlton Colts and we both transitioned from the back row to the front row. Please welcome Mr. Leroy Hughes. Leroy, how are you? Hi, Tim. How are you? Right? Very, very good. Now, let's start off with the Charlton Colts stuff because that is, you know, a big part of my sort of rugby history. And I know it's the same for you. When I joined the Colts, I wasn't particularly aware of like the history or the tradition of it. Was that the same for you or were you kind of aware of what you were going into? Um, I think I had an awareness of it because everybody wanted to play for the Colts, didn't they? No, I, I was at the club since I was oh, six. So I started at under sevens and worked all the way through. And uh, so I sort of knew everybody as they grew up as well. So obviously, as you went through, I had all the older older heads and bits and pieces. So I, I sort of knew them. Um, I didn't realise it was going to be like it was, to be honest with you. And it was it was a bit of an experience when you get there. And uh, it's how you get nurtured, isn't it, by the by the older cults as you as you go through. But it was it was a, a an eye opener and a, a life experience that I don't think I'll ever reenact ever again. And I don't, you know, there's more things I experienced there than I have in my life, to be honest with you, uh, with all your friends. So it's a uh, you know, great experience, great experience, and I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, because back in those days, Colts was under 19. So, you know, you'd still be at school, essentially, in your junior year. But along with side, a load of guys who'd already been through that the previous year and now were, you know, out of school, experienced in life. And just, you know, one year at that age is a massive difference. So tell me about kind of some of those people that you had as your sort of senior Colts in your junior year. So we had Duncan Cook, obviously, who was our captain. Very good captain. And I'll talk about him in a minute. Um, he was uh, a, a different type. Um, so we had him, obviously. Um, we had the likes of uh, Mark Vaughan, um, Charlie Mill. Um, I'm just trying to think now, going through all of them. There was, um, in fact, we actually had a, we used to have a chap called Mike, he used to do us uh, the choir sheets, he used to call it. And uh, we actually looked at him. So he had a whole year's worth of the choir sheets. So it went from every single game, which is absolutely amazing. The amount of people that actually played for that cult side in that year was, you know, it's in the 30s. So it was, a, it was such a good thing. Obviously, you had Roger Sainsbury. You know, we had South Africans that were coming over and playing. You know, absolutely great players. And, uh, yeah, they, they sort of, they educated us in, in how it was done. And, uh, you know, even... Matt Townsend, I can still remember him being on the bus. My Our first ever trip away, Matt was captain the year before and he came down and he showed us how to play the games, um, you know, how to act with all the different stuff, obviously how we had to dress, even those little things. You know, it was it was a, a total culture change in respect coming from um, where we used to, yes, we used to wear shirt and tie, but it was a certain way we had to do it with our beige trousers and our blue blue shirts, you know, and your, and your Colts tie. So it was, you know, I I got to say that's probably one of the best times of my life, to be honest with you, when, when we were doing that. And I'm sure you had exactly the same experiences. Yeah. Now you hit on something there, which I want to dig a bit deeper into, because we had a obviously a huge group of really talented local players. But every year we had three, four South Africans come over and join us as well. So talk a bit about the South Africans, what they're influence was and how they really helped us as a, as a team well it's because obviously woody had that connection didn't he with the with the schools over there and they used to come across they were just a different breed and and you know they, they were just mentally they were different which um you know when you look back they were they, they seemed older i don't know why but they seemed older than what we were they had a a different philosophy how they came across um you know we had dan vickerman who came in my year but it wasn't the the year above but the, the year after he was a year young and uh, he played for Australia obviously he played or oh, I think it must have been over 50 caps for Australia and what a different type of player you know just brutal absolutely brutal but that brought everybody into that same that same mold because you train like it and you train with people around you like it then it, it instills that sort of uh, culture of what you want to do and how you want to do it and uh, I think that's what they brought. I think they brought a different uh, type of 
rugby that we hadn't seen. It was, I'm not saying it was soft, it was just, it was a lot harder. It was more physical where they came from compared to where we were. Well, I kind of agree, but you must also sort of realise as well that Gloucestershire is one of the tougher places, you know, associate, you know, in, in sort of rugby sort of in the UK. It's not a soft place at all, but I do agree. They brought an edge that was just different to what we'd experienced before. Yeah, they, there was um, the funniest thing was the best player that I ever played with at Colts was a scrum half from South Africa. I think his name was Lyle Johnson. And he was just different. So he was just amazing. Everything he touched was just, he was better at passing, better at running, quicker than everybody. Just had everything going for him. To be honest, I, I, we lost con contact with him. I don't know where he went and after he went from Colts and things like that. So I don't know ever, wherever he went. But um, what, a, what a player. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, it's like, let's play with this chap because it was just one of those where you thought, actually, you know, we can work off him because he's just so good at what he did. Yeah, he arrived at the end of my senior year and like he never really played for us because it would have been a bit unfair on the guys that were already in the team sort of thing. But he's like he's a bit like Fafter Clerk, wasn't he? Like oh. sort of short, beautiful blonde hair, all that yeah, kind of stuff. That's right, yeah, it was, yeah. And but he had everything going for him. You know, it's uh that pace and the oh, it was it was great to watch as well. So obviously in the first year, you don't play as many games in your first year as usually in your second year when you're cops anyway. And uh, I, I was quite lucky. I, I think I played about 15 games in my first year when I was at Colts. Um, but obviously, I was at school, so you had to play school rugby on a Saturday morning. And then you'd go and bench in the afternoon for the for the Colts, and then you'd have half a game or whatever coming on. And uh, But playing with those types of players was, was fantastic. Yeah. Well, t talk to me about Duncan Cook then. And, uh, so, you know, Duncan, some of the things about so Duncan, him. I've known Duncan, so we went to primary school together. And um, so I've known him a very, very long time and uh, very talented rugby player. You know, he played really uh, good standard when he was a, when he was a kid. And then he obviously went off to Scotland and went to university in Scotland. But he was the Colts captain when we um, when I when I went up. And uh, I still remember we went to uh, we went to a Welsh, a Valleys club. I can't remember the actual name of it, but all I can remember on the sign, we don't like um, Englishmen. We'd like to kill them. That was the, in in Welsh, as it as it went went through, and we were thinking, oh crikey, this is a bit much. We had Ben Wilson playing prop. Now Ben Wilson, um, if anybody knows him, he was a second row. He was playing prop. I still remember it now. He absolutely got hammered all game, but fair play to him, he stayed there. But Nelly Bayliss, so Nelly Bayliss, he was a bit of a, a bit of a rogue on the rugby field, and uh, he used to frequently have a few scraps. So obviously these these Valley boys, they they. Uh, they they like to have a bit of a scrap, so they're obviously a big ding dong happened. Young boys and all, you know, trying to flex our muscles and things like that. Anyway, Nelly's clocked this one lad, and uh, he's he's having a red card. Duncan Cook, I've never seen it before, but Duncan Cook persuaded the referee not to give him a red card, and he stayed on the field. I've never known a captain ever do it before, because obviously when a, a referee's made their decision, they're going, aren't they? But somehow he had some way of actually influencing and talking and he brought it back round. I was like, oh, I couldn't believe it. And we're like, Nelly's gone. But he was he was still on that field at the end of the game. So I thought, fair play, Duncan. You know, that is outstanding skills. Well, Cookie is a very, very charming man. Was there, Can you remember anything about the detail of what he said? Was he just sort of so polite that the referee couldn't turn him down? I think that's, I think that's what it was. He had that little boy charm about him, didn't he? He was. Uh, he he always had that little smile, and he, he's always and obviously where he is now with his within what he does. You know, he's just got a good way, a good nature about how he talks to people. And I'm sure he came over as nice, a nice little posh lad, that um, to this Welsh referee, and he thought, oh, all right, we we'll, we we'll let him off this time. And that is, uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell you exactly what he said, but it must have been something brilliant because, to be honest, how he got away with it, I do not know because he absolutely leathered this kid. So, uh, so I, I was like, oh, all right then, okay, because everyone was just turning back to go back the other way and think, oh, we got, we can have our day now. Do you know what I mean? But fair play, he stayed on, he stayed on. <laughs> Amazing, and uh, of course, you went on to captain the Colts in the following year. Did did Cookie have? You know, was that any influence on how you captained the side, or you know, you did it your way? I think I did it my way. I, I'm a little bit. I always wanted to do it my way. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm that way in that way inclined. Obviously, I had a lot of influences from him. 
in respect of the ways to do it and and captains before you know because obviously i knew all the all the different age groups going through um you know i was quite lucky i did a lot of captaincy at school and bits and pieces so i i sort of had and the team that came through was my team that i'd obviously been captain for all the different age groups going through for Cheltenham. So I was quite lucky in that respect. But obviously I added on to that was we had obviously South Africans, we had Kiwis that came across. So that total culture of different different areas from different parts of the world, it just influenced everything. And it was it was great. It was absolutely, I learned massive amounts, uh, you know, as a person and, and as you, because you're growing up at that point, aren't you? You're becoming a man. Um, you know, and that responsibility. And I think probably from the from the coaching and the management as well, I think you sort of learned Roger was, you know, outstanding and he had things really into a T and in how we it was like being professional before it was professional, because that, that was a year that we turned professional, we turned professional. But he was very, very clinical on how he got things right. I'm sure you've probably got some stories as well from that sort of side of it. But then you had people like Jerry Finnegan, you know, the businessman that would bring that type of edge to your team. So everything was it was always done to a really high standard. Um, yeah, but it, it, it was, uh, you know, I learned massive amounts because that responsibility, you know, you had to go back in and you had to talk to the referees in those days. You'd go into the committee room and, and things like that. It's a really great opportunity, you know, it's, uh, and that's helped me in my further life, to be honest with you. Yeah, hundred percent. I was, when I came into the side, I was very much aware of the standards, you know, the standards that were set in everything that you did. And, and that came from like, the years before. And as you said, all these uh, impressive people in management. Now, a common question that goes on around the Colts, Charlton Colts, because pretty much every Colts team that came through for a long period of time was very good and very yeah. successful. Now, some people say, Leroy, that your team might have been the best ever. If that, if that was the case, you know, what kind of case would you be making to say that's true? I, I do this every time I see, speak to Mike Pittman, to be fair, because he, he winds up really quickly on all this. I would say that we didn't have the best players. We didn't have the best players. I would say that we were very close to having the best team. There's a difference between between them. Um, I think Roger. I think Roger's got the, probably the say so on a lot of the things that um, that sort of you sort of influenced by. But um, the only thing with our team is that we could play any style. So if you wanted to play physical, you could play physical. If you wanted to play out wide, and you know we had we had some really good players. Like if you actually went through our side, most of them, well, I say bar sort of five, played national level rugby, which you know you don't get many sides like that which I was very very lucky to to have a, a group of players that were the were talented in that in that respect um but it's, it's I think it's different as well different age groups you know it, it's very difficult to say that group's the best group or whatever because everyone was a very high standard weren't they you didn't get in the Colts team to be honest with you it was like a pinnacle everybody used to send their used to come to Chapman Colts in those days, didn't they? From all the, the other sort of your Stowe's and your other teams and all the, obviously the college boys used to all come in at that point as well. So, yeah, it, it'd be remiss of me to say that ours was the best team, even though you're always going to back yourselves. Um, but there was some, if you actually look through, like you said, you know, the people that you played with through that Colts team, um, there are so many good players that came out of that. You know, is, where are they all? Where are they at Cheltenham these days? Do you know what I mean? They're, but obviously everybody moves off and goes and does what they need to do, don't they? Um, but we were very, very lucky, very lucky that we had, well, Cheltenham at that point had organised uh, such a good fixture list um, to play the best, you know, they gave us that opportunity to play the best sides. And, you know, that's quite hard. If you look at the fixture list now, you would never get to, play the Leicesters, the the Cardiffs, the Baths, of what we did. You know, it, it, it just doesn't happen unless you're playing for DPD and it's a completely different thing now, isn't it? So um, I, I, I feel very fortunate to have played in that era, to be honest with you. Yeah, I do as well, actually. It was, um, yeah, it was special times. Now then, a big part of this as well was, um, you know, growing up as young men, going away, travelling together. Tell me about some of the stories from trips away or, or bus trips or anything like that. Um, so trips boys. So we've had um we went to New Bold Sevens. That was that was the um that was quite a funny trip. 
um, we were uh, we were going down, and obviously in those days we had a mini bus, so we had a couple of mini buses that went went down and uh anyway all the boys were having a few beers because sevens we were we were keen on sevens but we weren't that keen in respect of we're just going to go down you know we had the the likes of your lesters and all the stuff were playing at that time as well and um, so we all got on had a few jars and you know we're on the way anyway jerry finnegan was um was driving the bus i can still remember it now and uh we were all playing up a little bit and obviously everyone's come on, we need to stop now. Obviously you've had, cause in those days, obviously you had the bucket, didn't you? And all that sort of stuff. If you had to go to the toilet, cause it's such a long way and you couldn't stop on the motorway and things like that. And, uh, yeah, I can still remember the, probably one of the funniest bus trips. So we were all going at it and stuff like that. And I, uh, I had to go to the toilet. And, um, anyway, I said to Jerry, wind down your window chair. And he never heard me and he wound his window up. And I can still remember now chucking this whole load of wee out the window, but the window wasn't open. I was a bit drunk at that point. And it <laughs> splashed all over him. You imagine him driving along on the roads when it, obviously the young boys just chucked a load of wee all over you. Yeah, there was some, there was some absolute... Uh, you know, we used, to, we used to get away with so many things when we were in that time. You know... Cheltenham, going back to Cheltenham, the banana bus. So we had, I don't know, if, were you on that one when we went had the banana bus with Pete Lodge? So, no. Oh, that was hilarious. So we had, uh, we used to have like the the luxury uh, bus. So we used to go away, didn't we? When we're going all the way down to Barking, Penzance and all those places, you always had like the, the luxury bus. And uh, anyway, they always used to buy us bananas and, and bits and pieces that um, to make sure that you were fully... Uh, uh, hydrated and and uh, got enough energy for when you were playing. Anyway, I can still remember it now. There was a, it, I think we couldn't use the actual bus afterwards because we had a banana fight. So Lodgy started the banana fight, and uh, so all the leftover bananas and they just absolutely hurled everything at it. So it was just a, it was so funny. Obviously had a couple of beers on board at that point, do you know what I mean? But that was a, a famous a famous thing where the, the banana bus of old Lodge used to be called Banana Man after that. It was uh <laughs> there was there was some good uh there's some other stories I could say but I can't say them on the line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's uh they were the sort of the tame ones that we used to have. But to be honest with you, the bus trips were um I personally thought they were the best ones in in respect of getting away because we used to leave it sort of six o'clock in the morning to go down to Penzance or whatever to go and it was those bus trips back and then you would really forge those sort of friendships and and that silliness of understanding each other and having a few beers and having a sing you know and that's does that happen these days I don't know I I wouldn't think so because a lot of the stuff isn't that far to go anymore and if you are playing that type of level where you're going that far probably you're not doing this that sort of thing like because that they might be being uh, semi-professional or whatever these days so uh, we used to have some good fun we used to have some good fun no you weren't allowed on the back seat because matt mudway was the only person allowed on the back seat and he would tell everybody who was allowed on the back seat um but it was one of those you know i'm sure you've been on there many times with matt you know on that back seat with him um but no we used to we used to have a we used to have a good time just uh getting out doing you know seeing things and, and stopping on the i can still remember now we went to western we played western and funny enough obviously all the wives i, I wasn't i was too young for that at that point but all the wives they said that the bus had broken down so we stayed and we had all of this the bus hadn't broken down it was just that we got into the we'd got into that with a few a uh, few pints and uh that was the excuse for that we were late coming home so it was uh no, we used to have a we used to have a great time going there. and the sing songs. You know, that's one thing I do miss is that singing. You know, I've you know, it's uh, sad, obviously, with with Tainer, obviously recently, and um, when we went to the wake and what everybody had a sing song with all those things that went through, and it was just brilliant. So, it was so the things that we used to do together, and uh, Tainer would have been proud of that, to be honest with you, um, with all those all those things. So uh, yeah, that was just a couple of you know it's. Little little stories, really. It's uh, it's there's many more, but it's uh, <laughs> maybe not not for uh, put put an eight there. Yeah, I mean it's funny with those away trips. Sometimes there was more preparation done for what was going to happen after the game than for actually the game itself, right? In terms of fancy dress or knowing what to sing or fines or or anything like that. You you almost have to be more switched on after the game. 
definitely. Yeah. And that's not good when you've had a few beers, is it? That's, uh, is, I, I'm, I'm not talented in that way at all. So after a couple of beers, it's a way to waste the time, to be honest with you. But it's like drinking games. Absolute stupid rubbish at those things. So it's, uh, yeah, it is. Um, but they were, to be fair, those, those were the times that you forged those friendships, wasn't it? You know, I'm sure you've, you've, you've made many a friend that you, you sort of don't know them until you sort of get in there and then you're at your sort of, you're at your low because you've had a few beers and you're like, yeah, you know what I mean? Then you sort of bring them into it and, you know, it's great, isn't it? It's great in, in respect of getting to know people. And I, does it happen? I'm sure it still happens now. I don't know. Is that era of rugby gone? I don't know. What's your thoughts on that? I don't think it's gone, but I think it's far less. I think I think there's fewer clubs that do it, and and the further up, you know, the levels you go, the the li- less often that it'll happen. You know, it might be one social a year or something like that, or one before Christmas and one after. Um, I don't think it's. I definitely don't think it's gone. It's definitely not missing completely, but like I said, not as not as common as it used to be. That's for sure. No, no. I think that it's that, and I think society's changed, hasn't it? To be honest with you. So you can't do those silly things because it's all on video now as well, isn't it? So it's uh, you can't do them, can you? So uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it's a different era. It's a different era, definitely. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the rugby as well, then, Leroy. Because I'm right in saying you were an open side, right, and transitioned to hooker. Is that right? Yeah. So I played. Yeah. So when I was younger, I played open side all the time. They wanted me to play hooker when I was young. Obviously, to be honest, I was the right size for a hooker. I wasn't the right size for a back row player. Obviously, Neil Back at that time was my hero because he was coming through and he was a young, young, uh, small back row player. Um, so I sort of said, no, I, I enjoy playing in the back row, so I'm going to stay in the back row. So under 18s County, I played hooker. That's the time that I started playing hooker at that point. Um, then obviously for the Colts, I was, I was um, back row at the time. And then there was a crisis in the first team. So um, I think it was I think it was John Hawker I think was playing at the time. So he used to play Gloucester, uh, old Gloucester. Uh, Roger Brown was injured, um, so I don't think they had a they didn't have a hooker. Andy Cushing was was um, was coaching at the time, and uh, I was working with for him as well, doing um, some sports animation stuff. And um, anyway, he drafted me in. So I, what was I? Just turned eighteen, I suppose, and we. And uh, we had a load of games. I think we had about four games because the weather was so bad. Um, so there was a backlog of games. So it was like a, a Saturday game, a Wednesday game, and a Saturday game and all that sort of stuff. So I think we played Henley Hawks. So that's what that was sort of, to be honest, I was ele- I was probably about 11 and a half stone dripping wet at that point <laughs> as well. So I was very small, <laughs> but I could run. I could run around at that point. Um, but I was very, very lucky. I um, So I, I could play hooker, obviously, because I played it when I was younger. But it was, I went and played with Malcolm Preedy and I played with uh, Bob Phillips and, you know, ex-Gloucester, you know, they were outstanding. You know, I, I was so lucky, very, very fortunate. And uh, I still remember Bob, because that was my first game, he said, stop running around. He said, look at the game. He said, you're just running around. Stop running. Actually, look what you're doing. And I was like... Okay, thanks, Bob. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But it was, it was great. But it was like being in an armchair because they were so good. It was like being in an armchair in there. And to be honest, from that point on, so, you know, I played both then. I played hooker and back row um, for Cheltenham and, and stuff like that. Um, and it was, it was, it, I probably should have done it earlier, to be honest with you. Maybe, you know, it might have changed what I did and how I did it. But um, I loved, I loved playing back row. That was the only problem is I really enjoyed playing back row. It was, it, it was just more, you got the ball more, you did more things, didn't you? You know, it's um and especially seven you know it was it was great it's best position in it to be fair you know if you can if you're you know if you're half quick and you you've got an engine on you you're you're running around and you're doing the stuff aren't you so yeah that was my sort of transition really and then as i got older so you know i put on probably about four and a half stone five stone to be able to play going up the up the leagues um to be able to do it so it was um obviously Played with some really, really good players as well in that in that time. In respect of like people like Kramer that came to Cheltenham, um, um, they they sort of took you under their wing and they taught you how to do weights and bits. It's a little bit different to now, isn't it? Because youngsters today they're they're sort of taught straight away how to do weights. You know that conditioning, that strength and conditioning is put there. Um, in those days, you sort of just got in the gym and 
chucked a few weights on them, wasn't it? To be honest with you. So, yeah, it was. You didn't. Really, nobody really knew what they were doing. Really, there was no yeah. programs or anything like that. You just went in. Yeah. You knew maybe a couple of exercises and just cracked on. Who's the, who's the strongest at bench press? That's all they used to be, wasn't it? Who can who can bench press the most? And that was the that was the thing with it. So uh, yeah, so that's where I sort of went really. And then I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to play for Cheltenham, you know, in, in those positions. And and um, you know, sometimes I'd be okay, sometimes depending on who was available and bits and pieces. And then I had a little go at uh, Mosley for a season. Um, obviously, yeah. Tell me off. about that, mate. What, why did it, what? How did that come about? What were your thoughts in in going up there to Mosley? Um, so Don Caskey, obviously Don and Smithy had, were coaching. So I, I had a good season um, when Don and Smithy were there. I got player of the season or something like that. I was very loyal to Cheltenham. To be honest, I was a bit too loyal. To be honest with you, um, and I like they moved to to Mosley. And to be honest, I probably should have gone then. I was twenty five, I think then. You know, I was, you know, I was fit, and I was, you know, everything was in intact at that point. Um, and it was like, no, I'm a Cheltenham boy. I'm going to stay at Cheltenham. And you know, like, you know, like when you're sort of, uh, I was working for Mudways, and you know what I mean. It was one of those that you think actually, it's all here. Do you know what I mean? And I love Cheltenham. You know, the people I, I was playing with, I love, like, I love playing with them. So I enjoyed the social afterwards with them. And then, obviously, as you get a bit older, you suddenly think you're going to miss a chance. You know what I mean? You're going to miss a chance. So I went down and uh, I, th- I was I got a little bit disillusioned with Cheltenham. So I thought, right, this is the time then to, to go down. Obviously, I changed my job, which obviously didn't help. So I had to work shifts. But um, So then I went down there and I had an opportunity down there to play a few games for the first team down there. Um, and it was it was great because obviously that level was just a different standard, to be honest with you. Was I probably good enough? Probably I was on the verge. I'd probably, but my size, the size again came into it. If I was an extra two stone on top of that, I'd have been all right. Do you know what I mean? And a bit taller, but um, <laughs> but no, they were you know they were cracking side because they went up that year. They went up into the championship that year and stuff like that. So you know, I was I was very fortunate that you know I. I came off the bench most of the time, do you know what I mean? So it was, um, it was, but something that I can always say that I went down there and I trained and, and I did the best I could to get to do that. And, you know, Don and Smithy, you know, helped with that. So it was, uh, yeah, it was good. It was good. And it uh, and opened my eyes to like the standards that there are there. Because to be honest, everyone thinks they're brilliant. You know what I mean? <laughs> when they're young, you know, that arrogance and bits and pieces, but really you, you, you're all right. <laughs> do you know what I mean? When you look back, you think, actually, I was all right. But, you know, there was a lot of good players out there that you you come up against and you think, actually, yeah, there's different gravy as well, isn't there? So with all that sort of stuff. You know, you look at your buckos and the bits and pieces of who we played with when we were younger. They just went on and on and on. And they, you know, they're just different level, just totally different level. Yeah, talk about Bucko there. This is Pete Buxton, went on to play for Gloucester, a bit of a Gloucester legend, to be fair. He was your age, right? Your culture. He's our culture, yeah. So um, so Pete played with us. So he started at under nines, I think, Pete did. Uh, absolute lummox. Um, couldn't couldn't pass for Toffee. Still couldn't pass when he played for Gloucester. Um, no, yeah. The one thing he did have was the engine. I've never seen a, a person with, an engine like him, to be honest with you. And he's just, he just hurts people, doesn't he? He was just that big and clumsy. He used to just muller people going through. Um, very lucky to have played with him. Um, you know, when we were growing up and things like that. Obviously, from the age of about 18, obviously we never played again in respect because he went on to a different level. You know, he went to, he went to Mosley and then he went off to Newport and then, um, then he got in the Gloucester contract and, and things like that. So, you know, and he's done, he's done, you know, really, really well. For himself, lucky, it's a bit unlucky. He never got to England in respect of when he damaged his hand when he got put selected. But um, yeah, but obviously I'm still best mates of him in respect of he's, he's over in China at the moment. Um, he's uh, so I still speak to him very often. Um, so uh, he's uh, so he's over there, sports technician now. To be honest, he's gonna he's gonna hate me if he hears this. He just puts out the cones. <laughs> but he's uh, supposedly he's got a teaching degree, but I, I can't see it myself. Never went to university, <laughs> but um, no, he's uh, he's doing well, doing well. But um, yeah, it's uh, very you know as a you know as a best mate, like he, very proud of where, where he got to, and you know that he he did really really well. Um, just uh, 
in different circumstances, I'm sure he'd have had a few more England games, to be honest with you. Um, but he had a very, very good back row when it was playing at the time, wasn't it? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Let's go back to the Mosley time, Leroy, because yeah. I was really interested in what you said there about that standard when you go there for the first time and you look around and you're like, "Well, everything's moving a bit quicker. Everybody's a bit bigger. Like the skills are that much different." Like, did you find that intimidating or did you find that inspiring? I think it's inspiring, isn't it? Because you, you've got to play. You're playing with those top quality lads that have, you know that skill level it doesn't it's, it you're lucky if you have that skill you can't just train that skill level they they you know they're, they're innate isn't it in respect of what they've got um i can remember I, I did go and train at blackheath as well when i was at university down in in um in uh, greenwich um i went and played at blackheath i've never been in a training session where no one's dropped a ball <laughs> seriously i went to that training session i'd just come out of i think i was 21 or something like that and I went down there and I just couldn't believe the standard. And there was a lot of ex-Aussies there. But um, but it was, you know, it's that sort of, and exactly the same as when you're there. You know, that, that the standards of what you, you're expected, small uh, small percentages that, you know, you can't miss a line out. You can't, do you know what I mean, in certain areas because you're never going to have that opportunity again because the, the standard's so high. You know, when they talk about it on the telly, it's, it's you can sort of understand it a little bit more in respect of, those little things are the are the thing of of, um, of what you're doing, isn't it? So, it's um, yeah. I, I probably um, I learnt massive amounts about myself and the game, to be honest, in that year. To be honest with you, um, and that sort of that sort of helped me with my coaching, really, because you can you can sort of start to look at things and break it down and analyze it, and uh, and that helped me. That helped me massively. So. Um, yeah, and that's you know that's where I wanted to go after I played as well. So that was um, that was good. Yeah, let's talk about that because I had a similar thing as well. You know, went to a few different clubs, saw how lots of different people did things, and then for me, I just sort of like almost like cherry picked the bits that I liked and the way I enjoyed being coaching, uh, coached rather. Was that the same with you, or did you kind of just have your own stamp on it as well? Yeah, I learned a lot. I. I was really lucky. So when I so I, I did the ladies anyway. I, I started off with doing Chatham ladies. So obviously um, that was when I was about twenty one, and with Cheltenham as well, we used to go and do um, the school. So we used to go to Cleve School because there was a community stuff. So I used to do a lot of that, and then obviously with Cushing, I I created a uh, coaching. So he used to draw out all the coaching stuff, and I used to put on computer animations um, before Crispo went into it, and then. Um, and that was sort of my in into coaching, like that analysis of what it is. I, I, I think like that anyway, um, to be honest with you. I, I think about how you can break things down to make it better. And um, that sort of gave me that sort of impetus. Actually, I quite enjoy this part of it and, and actually doing it. And um, so from that, obviously, then I went on to um, Saris, Chantham Saracens, um, to go and do that. And uh, I was really fortunate. Ollie Morgan was coaching there at the time, um, and uh, I learned a lot, a lot of things. Obviously, coming from Gloucester and and things like that, and that sort of the different ways you play. You know, I I had a certain way I wanted forwards to play, so I was a forwards coach at that point. Um, but how does that mix in with what you've got? So one thing I did find when I was playing, people sort of copied everything off. So like you'd have a, a I don't know, say a professional team and that professional would come down and teach you, but they would teach you the same things as what they're being taught. But the one thing that they didn't have, what probably we've had is that we've come through, we've played at a lower level. So we understand that actually that won't work. So yeah. we want that, we want that stuff, but how do we get it for the people? Cause the people aren't skilled enough or um, they've got the desire to do it. And, and the, but you can bring parts of it, and the best way to develop that for them, isn't it? And uh, so that was my sort of my sort of thing of like breaking it down. How can we get it's like um, I can remember playing three pod system, yeah, which is what Gloucester used to play when we were at Cheltenham. Now that was fine, but we didn't have big massive back row players on the wing. We had like little blokes that aren't going to make that impact. So what we should have done was highlighted sort of um, really 
good runners with the ball to go and do those roles and things like that because you haven't got that talent all the way through your, your side like a like a, a professional outfit would would they so that was that's the sort of stuff that used to interest me really and 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 learning off those those people that are you know they're getting spoon like given all this information and uh, but still keeping the cultures and the and the sort of the grounding of what a grassroots rugby is all about because I was brought up at Smith's uh, when I was like watching my dad and things like that and that sort of had a massive influence on me it's about friendships and uh, how you build group dynamics in in what you do and how you do it so that's what sort of interests me really about all the coaching side of it how can you get the best out of a, a group of people that won't be the most talented because you're not coaching the best sides because we're, we're coaching at a lower level um, but you can still achieve and, and really get uh, an outcome that you know everyone's positive and and you can have a good time doing it. That was that was my sort of thing um, to to actually uh, think about as well. So um, yeah, so I did that and then obviously went to Chatham Saracens. Had a great great time there. You know the the social side of uh, Chatham Saracens is fantastic. Um, we had some really really good players there. Um, so we took them on. I was very fortunate that it was going on a bit of an upward curve at that time so we got them up to i think it was lost lost to one i think it was at that point and uh yeah it i i had a group of young men that were fantastic were they the most and this is doing them a disservice were they the most talented probably not but their physicality and their mental um approach to the rugby I've never seen it change so much over over a season, and to be honest, that I loved it because it was it just changed their philosophy of what's going on, and you know why, they would. Why did, why, did it, why did it change, Lee? Roy, what happened? What, why and how did it change? I think you got to look at it in uh, if you know, like when you, it's that sort of consistent messaging of like if you if we keep on doing this, like just little bits of just knocking it away, getting better at certain areas of the game. Fitness, you know, well, let's get you fitter, let's get you stronger type, type of stuff. But it's providing them with that opportunity to do it. Instead of it being where they might have been a few years before, where they, they didn't have that opportunity, then you just provide that for them and that platform. They, they've got to do the work. You know, as much as coaching, everyone likes to think that as, as a coach, you're like, oh, I changed the world and all this sort of stuff. That, it, it's not. It's, it's about changing the environment for them to prosper in that, isn't it? That's how I look at it anyway. Um, that's and and to be honest, that that was probably my best coaching time. To be honest with you, uh, most enjoyable. And I was young, and I just stopped playing. So it was like you know you're really into it because I was still young as well. So you could you could sort of have a good crack with with all the lads and and things like that as well. So it was that sort of that sort of time uh, moving forward. And uh, but no, I, I, I had a fantastic time. They were. A, Good people, really good club. You know, they they you know they they work really hard in respect of trying to keep that grassroots and keeping that sort of good fun. It's not just about trying to be elite, if you know what I mean. Trying to to be there, and that's what I like. I like that's what I think rugby's all about, really. You know, coming from our cult days, you know that that's you know it relates back into all of that, isn't it? So it's um, so that's what that's where that sort of went. And then um, I had a couple of years off, I, obviously with work and things, I had kids and bits, and then uh, I went to Cheltenham after that. So I coached Cheltenham for a couple of years, um, which was good. Um, you know, that their standard was high. Um, we sort of developed it from there. Now, with all of this, I, I'd have to mention, it'd be remiss of me not to say about Archie. So Archie Nelms, he... he as a manager, he, he sort of helped me out massively in respect. He organised a lot, a lot of things. And it's that setting of that, those things that, that does help. And um, we sort of, so we had a bit of a, we had a bit of a rocky start, at, uh, rocky start at Cheltenham. So we, I think we lost the first 11 games. I even had to get Mudway back. So we had to get <laughs> Mudway back at that point. And he was 40, what was he then? He was 40 odd then. I won't say his, his, his age, but he was... Uh, so we had to even get that, do you know what I mean, where people had retired and it was it was one of those times where, the, you know, where the club sort of changes from different people. And then we had to go out and we looked and recruited and we got people and then we went on a 22-game winning streak. So it was, so we went from the bottom right to the, to near the top. So it was, uh, it was good. It was, it was good. Facilities, obviously, Chapman's got fantastic facilities. You know, it's got, it's got everything there with the 4G pitches and things like that. So it's, uh, 
you know, it, it, it's one of those it's, things changed a little bit. Obviously, I, I had to pull away from that, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was a it was a good time in respect of um, we we got a lot out of the out of the chaps. To be honest with you, um, it was just a little bit different philosophy at the club compared to the Saris. That's what I found was quite difficult. Um, it wasn't that sort of basis, which Cheltenham's never had that old boy basis of of going through. But they've got old boys. I'm not saying they haven't got old boys, but they haven't got that sort of that that way through. But um, continuity, players, continuity, yeah. yeah. It's um, so I did that, and then um, yeah, then since then I've uh, I've retired. <laughs> to be honest with you, um, I'm not involved in the game at all at the moment. Then Leroy. No, I've done a little bit. I go go down and help out with some of the under, I think it's under 12s sometimes, and just go and help them out, you know, if they want to do some scrummaging and things like that. Um, obviously, different things happen in life that you have to sort of put them priorities in it with family and things like that. But, um, yeah, I do miss it. I do miss that sort of, but then as well, you've got that commitment of what you're doing and because it's not just about turning up, it's about the other stuff, isn't it, about instilling what you're trying to, create really isn't it that culture that because that doesn't just come with a couple of hours training session on a tuesday and a thursday so uh yeah it, you know when you when i do things it's got to be done to the to the you know what i mean you go past the point sometimes but it's um but it is um it it sort of opens your eyes to it all doesn't it you know the amount of work that these people do behind the scenes within these grassroots clubs is is brilliant you know they, they you don't realize until you're actually part of that of what people do do and it's uh you know when we were playing we didn't know half the things we just turned up the shirt was put on our backs they were giving us a, a a nice banana and a nice drink to go out with and then you come back in and there's a there's a jug of beer for you to have a beer wasn't it you know it didn't really have that we didn't get that sort of education of like you had to go and put the post out and all those sort of things did we to be honest with you um but no, that's that sort of like where we, where we've sort of gone with the coaching and and stuff like that. So it's uh, it has been good. With this Smiths stuff, mate, something you mentioned there about uh, getting on with the lads really well, being yep. sort of a similar age, just a little bit older. Was that, was that ever a problem, or were you quite comfortable, you know, socialising with the players, kind of thing, or did you feel that needed to be a separation there? Uh, there was. So there was a sort of um, so the Saris the Saris is quite a funny because obviously I played I played I did play for a season, but obviously at that point my knees had gone and bits and pieces everything else had gone at that. But um, but that sort of I think you put down your you set out your stall as as Yorkie used to say set out your stall straight away so everyone knew exactly where you where you're coming from. Um, but I think you've got to nurture people as well. So there's different ways of of doing that. So that divide between a um, you're playing and you're coaching. Yes, there is that divide, um, but then you can still let you not. That's not the right word. The guard, but you can sort of be person like who you are, so they can see who you are and how much it does mean to you to to actually because you want them to succeed, don't you? No, I I always you know when people say whatever whatever level, even if it's you know you're playing your third team, but they've improved. That's what you want. You want people to go out there and are you enjoying the game? Because at the end, it doesn't matter if you're the best or the worst, as long as you're enjoying the game, because that's what it's about, isn't it? And uh, so that was my sort of philosophy of, yes, you know, we are human. You sort of, you they can see that I'm human as much as them, because you, no one's that all, all knowing and all conquering, are they? So you've got to have that sort of, you know, that, I've read lots of books about this cultural sort of stuff. You know, it's uh, it's one of those I, I do believe in. Really, your values like devolving your values down, and everybody's building that culture together. And uh, you know, the the Kiwis are brilliant at it. Do you know what I mean? Of, of how you how you act and how you you perform and and how you come together. You know, so it is. Uh, that's how I sort of that's how I like to be anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's it's better to be human. And it is trying to be something that's, you know, that pinnacle of I am this type type of uh, coach, which we've all had then. Do you know what I mean? Like I say, you do. Um, I don't think that works. I think it's about, OK, that my idea won't work. How can we adapt it to make it, you know, come to that compromise of the best way? Because some of these things you, I've never played sort of fly off at that level. Or do you know what I mean? So you're asking them to do something that, Really, in your mind, that can work, but 
does it really work for that person? Because that person might not be talented enough to do what you're asking them to do. So it's it's that sort of getting to know who they are and uh, what's better than having a beer with them to to actually you know find out who they are and what their family does and you know that sort of you know we used to oh, big Dave blooming at Sarries he used to turn up half an hour before the game he was a plasterer he said Leroy do you want to pay my money pay me my money and I said I can't no he said right then so I'm working because I've got to go to work so that's but he used to come on and he used to do really really well it frustrated the hell out of me but it's reality isn't it it's reality of what what life is and you know if you've got to, you've got to go out to work on a Saturday morning to go and earn some extra money you've got to do it haven't you so no I think that's uh I think that's a sort of it's totally different if you're talking professional you know what I mean it's a, it's a completely different thing isn't it but um yeah it is um it is like I've I've learned massively because you know when even in work situations you know you you sort of use these situations across life don't you to to actually manage people in a way that's that um that helps and by be by being human and and sort of talking and making sure everybody's all right you can you can get the best out of them that's how i would look at it anyway mate that is a brilliant summing up of what it's like to be a coach at the sort of community level um so i think that's a great place to finish this part of the of the show and we'll move on to the stash section so Leroy Hughes what is your favorite bit of stash that you've ever received um I would say probably can you remember the blue tops that Cheltenham used to have yeah yeah, yeah that, they... that's probably my favorite because they were horrible but I used to love it <laughs> I used to love that wearing that kit that was good that was good and then with a with a, a really old school old school um uh waterproof uh top that they used to give you on there that was probably the that was probably my best one yeah those blue shirts are beautiful um what about favorite kit of all time so this can be any team from any era i'd say auckland blues Ooh. what what era what what which we're one talking are we looking? 90s okay yeah 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 um jonah lomu kind of era that's it yeah like the stripey ones and the and all that sort of stuff that was good i used to like that yeah, they brought. They've actually this year. They brought. They've done a sort of retro kit based on that one. Uh, the Is it? Blues. Yeah, yeah. They to be have. honest, that's one thing. Have, have you actually watched any Super Fourteen or whatever it is now? Super. It's not on the telly anymore, is it? Not for a long time. No, I haven't no. watched it. Yeah. Um, what about awful kit, Leroy? Uh, some kit that you would sort of prefer to burn rather than wear. So I can still remember now. Saris, we uh, we had a sponsor, CPS. So. Chapman Plastering Solutions gave us some yellow T-shirts uh, that we had to warm up in. Um, awful things, um, embarrassing to go out in it. But the person who who got who actually paid for them loved them, so we had to do it every single week. <laughs> That's magic. That brings a team together as well, doesn't it? <laughs> when you go through a hardship like that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, mate. Amazing. Um, before we wrap up, is there any sort of anything else you want to say, or any sort of closing thoughts at all? Uh, no, it's been it's been lovely to speak to you because I haven't spoken to you for ages, and um, yeah, it's um, it's nice to speak to the old old guys that you used to play with because it's those <laughs> same it's having those same uh, sort of um, experiences, isn't it? As we grow up, it's, it, you've got that sort of common common sort of uh, approach to what rugby is and life is as well. I think to be honest with you. So it's been lovely to speak to you. Yeah, you too, mate. And if people want to get hold of you at all and, and talk about any coaching or anything like that, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, you can email me on LeroyHughes at Hotmail.com. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, mate. Everything we've spoken about today will be linked in one place, and that's at AmateurRugbyPodcast.com. So it just leaves me to say thanks very much, mate, and it's been a real pleasure. Uh, it's good to see you. Keep well. Okay, there he goes, Mr. Leroy Hughes. What a brilliant summing up of what it's like to be a community coach and those influences as well from the from the top end there. People like Ollie Morgan, who played for England, and you know so many great insights, but not all of them applicable to lo lower league rugby. I thought that was really insightful there. So thank you, Leroy, for that. Much appreciated. Now, during the Great Rugger Run over the last three years, I've been to literally hundreds of rugby clubs. And a lot of them struggle a little bit with their social media. So if that's you, if you feel like 
you're not getting enough bang for the amount of time you spend on your social media, I'm looking to potentially uh, put up some some sort of free training, some help with that. If that's you, go to amateurrugbypodcast.com forward slash social and I will uh, and put your details in there. Tell me what issues you're having and we'll hopefully get something sorted out that for that. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff, the liking, the commenting, uh, some reviews will be great as well, uh, especially over on YouTube where there's a ton of extra content as well. But what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. So until then, get out and play.